uh, good evening to one and all uh, i would like to welcome everyone for joining and participating in the 19th world wind energy conference today we shall be talking about batteries for storage in electric vehicles i would now request uh, manik purana to carry forward the meeting thank you thank you so much uh, very good evening to everyone i'm sorry we faced some technical issues at the beginning i think we should be all good now so um, it's a indeed a pleasure to have all of you with us today to discuss this important topic i'll just start by giving a few initial remarks and then we will carry on with two presentations and then to a panel discussion so i hope you all enjoy the event that we have planned out today so just to uh, give you the background as we have all heard and i am sure we all have gone through the n number of news items which have come from cop26 india is decided that we will grow but we will grow in a sustainable development manner what that would mean is going forward a uh, more and more stress on renewable energy with equally focused efforts to go on with the e mobility initiatives which have taken place now as we are all aware as we move towards renewable energy more and more renewable energy in our system renewable energy is not something that can be switched on and off and frankly we know when the sun shines so it needs to be stored you have to ha make it more reliable you have to make it less variable and you have to make it something that you can switch on and switch off just the way you need your base load to do so this is where we uh, the battery storage comes in to play a very vital part also we all whoever is staying in delhi obviously knows of the pollution which is there and in other cities in india and we need to think about how to clean not only the electricity sector but also the other usage which contribute to the pollution so there is where the e mobility factor comes in and the move from ice vehicles to evs i think so basically in this was 2 years back now when the government announced a national mission on transformative mobility and battery storage understanding that this is not something which is to be done by one ministry it is something which will which needs to be interministerial a interministerial committee was formed under niti aayog niti aayog was set the task of you know taking care of this mission and coordinating across various ministries and departments how the ecosystem of the transformative mobility and battery storage can be strengthened and how do you facilitate this market niti aayog recently has also come out with a documents for its production linked incentive scheme where the government is incentivizing people to set up manufacturing units in india so basically if you look at that mission on the supply side there's a huge subsidy program which uh, the production linked incentive program which has been set in place and on the demand side is where basically world bank is assisting niti aayog to build the demand the demand is supposed to come of batteries is supposed to come on the e mobility segment and on the power system segment and when we were when we were given this assignment we started with the technical assistance so what you will hear in in the next two presentations is the work that the world bank along with niti aayog had undertaken to understand one the e mobility market what are the drivers of the e mobility market out of all the segments which will uh, you know come in which segments need to be focused on first what are the policy regulatory changes need are required similarly on the battery storage front world bank did studies to understand where is the need for battery storage how much battery would be required what are the policy regulatory things that need to take place for the market to take off 
But one thing which was sure that we were clear about after the studies that it cannot only be the demand is there and it will come out, but there is a certain ecosystem which has to be set up to make sure the demand actually translates. And that is when we start looking at the standards, we start looking at the testing, we start also discussing about recycling, reuse, and obviously the entire thing boils down to financing. So once these elements are all in place, uh, there is also a financing line which is being put in place so that for these technology which are transform uh, transformative and completely new, there is a line of credit which is available and uh, to the developers and it can be accessed at a very concessional rate. So the idea behind this entire program would be to set up uh, the initial the kickstart the market of in both these segments and then as it reaches to uh, you know to the commercial stage let the market take it on and without much ado i would now uh, hand over uh, to sunil deal who will introduce the two presenters that we have and then we will go on to the panel discussion over to you sunil good evening everyone uh, it is indeed a privilege to welcome a panel of distinguished speakers at the Batteries for Storage and Electric Vehicles session at the World Energy Conference 2021. Many thanks to the international organizations who have endorsed the event, including ISA, IGF, KFW Development Bank, and National Institute of Wind Energy. I now introduce Anish. Anish is a partner with Deloitte India and leads the future of energy focus for the firm. He has over 15 years of experience in ERI sector and serves client across the public and private sector. And Anish has led the World Bank's story, World Bank study on battery storage assessment at Intrastate Transmission and Distribution Network. Over to Anish. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Thank you, Mani. Um, <clears throat> it's again indeed a pleasure to be a uh, part of this. Uh, um, session but uh can i have a sharing right uh, i have a um, short presentation on the study you can share thank you thank you yes right hope the slides are visible Visible. Thank you. Right. So um, I think um, Mani already gave a, a brief outline of the project, but I will uh, just briefly talk about the scope of work, what we did for Niti IO, co-sponsored by World Bank. Uh, so um, we, we, we kind of assess the demand for battery storage from the electric, electricity sector. So, of course, a large part of the demand of the battery storage comes from the EVs, but a significant part of the battery storage, because of the, uh, because of the priorities, what India has set um, of adding renewables will of, always be kind of balanced by battery storage. So, therefore, battery storage forms an integral part of this entire net zero journey. Therefore, to assess the demand for battery storage in the near future was one of the, um, I would say, objectives of this assignment. Uh, now, so so the optimal sizing of the battery storage in in kind of four select states, and the states were selected like, um, as I said, it's there Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and West Bengal. So we picked up uh, three kind of renewable rich states, uh, but and as well as West Bengal, uh, just wanted to understand that what's the kind of battery requirement coming from states which are non-renewable rich states as well, and which is lesser or lower potential of renewable, uh, if I may say that. Uh, so 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 a diversified set of kind of states were picked up, and um, the scope was to assess the kind of demand the battery storage would have. Um, in the 2030 time scale. Uh, now, once it's kind of assessed that, 
Okay, so this is the need for battery storage. Then of course, uh, what would be the optimal siting of those battery storage in the transmission and distribution network? Um, now to facilitate and as well as kind of uh, enable battery storage installations and deployment, what's the kind of policy and regulatory environment today we have and what's the kind of changes we'd require based on the best practices, based on what globally um, some of these installations have taken place, what are the policy enablements have taken place, so all that. And finally, of course, to prepare a kind of a bidding document, uh, which could actually uh, be taken as a standard bidding document for deployment of uh, battery storage, right? And, um, and the last piece was, of course, to support Niti Aayog on the technical aspects of the ACC as well. So that's been successfully already been kind of launched and um, yeah, and, and the government of India is excited to kind of uh, roll out that process and receive bids uh, accordingly. So that was the overall scope of work uh, for us. Uh, so we took an approach to assess the battery demand um, basically based on the current regulatory and policy framework what we have. And therefore, um, we all know, we all talk about that a battery is, of course, um, uh, one such device which can actually be valued more from the stacking approach and not necessarily only on one use case. So therefore, value stacking approach was, of course, uh, kind of considered, but at the same time, um, uh, there needs to be a consideration that what kind of policy and regulatory, um, um, I would say, implications that what that means, right? So uh, there were uh, value stacks kind of considered on the left hand side. If you see the value stacks which have been considered are like energy arbitrage or pick shifting, ramping support because of renewables coming in. There will be definitely ramping support required, especially in the renewable rich states. And then capacity up upgrade deferral in the TND network and as well as TND loss reduction. So these were some of the value stacks considered um, in the value stack approach. Now, the DSM reduction approach, which is the DSM penalty, what we have, at least in India, there is a unique feature called uh, deviation settlement mechanism. And um, uh, we have a penalty associated in the DSM as well, where the utilities and as well as the generators are subject to uh, penalties if they are not meeting the, uh, if they are not meeting a specified kind of, uh, or if they are deviating from their DIH schedules, right? So, uh, so both these and this DSM, um, has several components like the additional DSM charges and as well as sign change penalties. And these are penalties which are which are applicable to all the utilities and not been supported by the regulator. That means uh, it's a not, not a pass through to the tariff and therefore it hits the bottom line of any utility. And therefore to reduce these DSM charges, of course, the utilities need to put their own capex which will not be funded to the um, regulators are not be funded through the uh, tariff process, uh, right, filing procedures. So both these uh, approaches we, we have taken and we have assessed that what's the kind of requirement for each of those four states from, if we follow both these approaches separately, right? We haven't really combined because of uh, regulatory kind of um, separations. Now the approach, um, um, before we go into the approach, we just wanted to have this slide uh, so that everyone understands about the value stacking approach. Uh, so the illustrative example of a value stacking approach, if you see, uh, this is a typical kind of a, say, for example, a dispatch uh, for a particular um, uh, day or, um, or, or, or say, a, a particular day in a year, right? So uh, the thermal will forms your base load or forms the base load at least for now in most of the states, right? And therefore, um, uh, that's that's been dispatched, and then there are mass run uh, sources which are hydro as well as uh, renewables, and you have solar and all. Right uh, now, if you keep on adding solars, or the, not at the current level of solar, but probably at certain states when you add more and more renewables, then you will have excess renewables at certain periods of the day, especially during the solar hours, and that's when the strategy should be to actually charge this because that's as good as a kind of a zero cost power, right? So that's when you charge. And then in the evening time when there could be peak, and that's where the peak arbitrage could be there, uh, which is again highlighted in the blue uh, uh, kind of color, sky blue color or light blue color, because um, uh, the other part of the um, green, which is the must run that you can't kind of do a, any kind of uh, say curtailment. 
Therefore, the arbitrage available with you would be on the thermal. Right? In addition, you have benefits of ramping support, which is during the, uh, say, for example, when solar comes in as well as uh, solar uh, in the evening hour when, when, when it suddenly goes down. So therefore, there is a lot of ramp requirement. Uh, all your thermal base load will be at a technical minimum and suddenly you are required to kind of ramp up. So we need to see that whether are, uh, there are any ramping constraints being hit on a 15 minute time scale. So that's the kind of course modeling what we have done as well. And then the capacity deferral and reduction in transmission losses. So when we were doing the optimal siting within the TND network, so this is an iterative process or it's kind of an interlink process. So when you position your battery storage in those networks, so what's the kind of capacity deferral and as well as transmission losses, which can add to the benefits of stacking, that's also got evaluated. And accordingly, the battery sizing was kind of determined, right? Um, so yeah, I think I'll not delve much into the uh, overall process, but what it means is it requires a lot of data, which is 15 minute time scale data, and we collect it from all the states. Uh, uh, Niti Aayog, of course, uh, helped us a lot in kind of reaching out to the states and um, requesting them to share the data. This is done through an optimization model, a MILP kind of a model setup. So we uh, where a lot of, of course, inputs uh, um, uh, are required. So we did that and then uh, the optimal battery capacity was determined. Um, um, so on the DSM penalty, of course, we, we kind of modulated the behavior of the DSM. We, of course, studied on a 15 minute basis, what's the kind of DSM charges uh, an utility faces. And therefore, if a battery can be kind of modulated or simulated in a behavior where it actually charges, uh, SOC level is maintained at say, for example, 60%, it goes and up and down and actually uh, kind of reduces the DSM penalty, uh, sign change penalty, as well as the additional penalty. So that's where we simulated as well. Uh, so what we have as results um, um, are, uh, as per these four states, um, uh, that will uh, briefly outline. But before that, I think the nature of the uh, nature of each of these states, uh, how the procurements are, uh, we'll quickly touch upon that. Say, for example, Gujarat mean forms, currently it's predominantly something around 61% of the renewable capacity, right? So 61% uh, is wind itself. And there are those gas based stations, um, uh, which are, which are of course being kind of utilized, uh, but not utilized in probably an optimal fashion in more of a suboptimal fashion. So there have been dispatches in the state where we see that um, gas plants have been dispatched in open cycle mode at a very high cost, even if there are other stations which could be actually meeting those capacities itself if, if optimally being dispatched. So there are those um, suboptimal level, um, I would say scheduling and dispatch which has been taken uh, there. Uh, in MP also, we have seen suboptimal dispatches of expensive stations, but not so very significant, uh, very exceptional scenarios, probably due to some technical constraints. Um, but arbitrage opportunities are mainly driven by future high cost coal stations. There are those high cost coal stations. And if you assume escalation of 3.45% on a year on basis, the arbitrage available for battery storage is quite high. Um, considering it's a renewable rich state and therefore you have surplus capacity to charge your battery storage as well. Um, for Tamil Nadu, what we have seen is of course, it's a renewable rich state, but at the same time, they have significant pump storage already available for 400 megawatt operational, 500 megawatt under construction and 1000 megawatt plan. So when you take all of that in the system, uh, so, um, so battery requirement, um, of course, comes after considering there is a PSP and more or less PFC and battery serves the same purpose. So the battery requirement in Tamil Nadu, of course, comes down because if all that pump storage comes alive, if it doesn't come, of course, there's a requirement of equivalent amount of pump storage what they have already planned. And in uh, West Bengal also, since the requirement of renewables is lower or, or they have plans to add lower renewables, but they have already a pump storage and they have something around kind of upcoming pump storages as well, amounting to overall kind of 1900 megawatt. So therefore that's also one such consideration which we need to know, right? Also the other thing is uh, we, we kind of model the system under two different uh, battery costs, of course. 
and the battery cost again that's again debatable so we don't have a firm cost in the market which can be taken as a kind of a standard right so we only have budgetary cost uh, this analysis was carried out almost one 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 year um, uh, and therefore the budgetary cost available is definitely can be optimized and the ce estimates in the optimal generation report that's also there and that's been one more kind of uh, say for example a scenario which has been considered and ca's um, estimates are almost 25% lower than what the budgetary cost what we have uh, received from seki so therefore there is a little bit of a uh, i would say um, optimize optimization that can take place even in today's time if we if we follow a bit process right um so what we have currently is um, uh, if you see in gujarat uh, tamil nadu and uh, gujarat mp and tamil nadu um, just on a kind of overall summary basis uh, we see battery storages the need for battery storage is coming in as early as kind of 2023 2024 2025 in gujarat and then uh, probably in mp and tamil nadu um, uh, mp in 2027 tamil nadu because of its existing pump storage and plans pump storage of almost 1000 gigawatt and other kind of 900 megawatt of, uh, under construction or 2000 megawatt uh, under plan so it's kind of coming in 2029 and 2030 horizon right um but what's important is uh, these are again at ca cost estimates so any kind of optimization of costs uh, what it means is we'll have battery battery storage is coming in large quantum in at in 2025 2026 time scales itself uh, so and these quantums are huge so if you see a 4 hour battery in terms of megawatts 5000 megawatt uh, by uh, 2030 that's the cumulative addition what we are talking about so almost almost like um, um, in in the sense um, uh, 4000 4 4 hour um, battery and then uh, in in mp we have a overall requirement of 827 megawatt of 4 hour battery and a 23 megawatt of 2 hour battery and as well as in tamil nadu we have a 2000 megawatt of 4 hour battery uh, so 4 hour batteries are are being kind of of course um, uh, say for example when a utility launches even in us deployments what we have seen is 4 uh, hour batteries have much more predominant when utility scale uh, batteries are we are talking about a 1 hour battery makes sense more for ancillary deployments where uh, predominantly a large part of your revenue share comes from ancillary uh, but these are these are revenue streams being stacked up more from the perspective of ramp and as well as um, uh, arbitrage and as well as capacity referral and tnd loss so so in that perspective 4 hour batteries makes sense um on dsm as we said um so what we have uh, we have a 24 megawatt Uh, which is a one hour battery it's equivalent to some kind of an ancillary applications if you can say that uh, so therefore one hour battery is far more suitable for dsm applications and there we see that gujarat will require in 2022 2023 time scale itself something around 2024 20, megawatt hour of battery madhya pradesh would be 65 uh, megawatt hour of battery tamil nadu will be require something similar around 22 megawatt hour and west bengal is 3 megawatt hour so these are some kind of a so all amounting to something around 113 megawatt hour of batteries uh, is required uh, in this year and overall kind of in the next couple of years to reduce their dsm penalties uh, so that's that's in brief uh, what we have today as a result um, correspondingly of course um, um, means these are some of the deployments this is from the deployment side but on the policy and regulatory if i have 2 minutes i'll just add a uh, few things which which needs to be considered um, for large scale deployment of battery storage of course um, one is a energy storage policy which uh, which is again required uh, considering that we are adding significant amount of uh, renewables uh, second is um, a two sided uh, it's a device where you charge and discharge as well right so as you charge and discharge um therefore uh, the transmission charges needs to be kind of waived off uh, and should not be applied on your charge and discharge and this has been across the markets this has been done third is on the ancillary market if you really want to see uh, value addition by the battery storage then 
a faster responding resources like battery storage needs to be compensated adequately and as well as kind of incentivized for participation. And we have seen several examples in PJM and other US markets as well. There are differentiated kind of pricing mechanisms and as well as strategies where you incentivize uh, uh, battery storage. Um, so yeah, with that note, um, I will end. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to respond. Uh, over to you, Sunil. Thank you. Thank you, Anish, for the insightful presentation. And 2020, uh, the decade of 2020 is definitely the energy storage decade. And I'm confident that the industry is ready to deliver. I now introduce Mancha. Mancha is a management consultant and economist. She has worked across the railroad, aviation, urban sector, and transport sectors. And she has recently led the World Bank's client engagement on electric mobility, urban transport, and governance. Over to you, Mancha. Uh, thank you, Sunil, for a very warm welcome. And thank you, Manif and Anish, for introducing the topic. Uh, indeed, a very important one that the world is talking and the eyes are really on India to spearhead the mov movement. I would, uh, I also just like Anish, have a small presentation to showcase what we have done in the study and uh, Thank you all for participating and please feel uh, after the session, I'd be happy to take any questions on it. So I'm just sharing my screen now. Uh, request a moment, please. Uh, so at start, uh, so uh, with Niti Aayog and World Bank has uh, spearheaded the study on EV market assessment business models and action plan in India and Steer Group had supported World Bank in conducting the study. Um, uh, we'll start with the overall project overview. As we all know that India is really at a very nascent stage of electric mobility growth, World Bank really wanted to assess the current market situation and, and see which, where, the high impact business models and market segments are, which can be sort of pushed forward by developing key interventions and um, inc increase the penetration of EVs overall. Um, so we looked at three primary markets, uh, charging infrastructure, private vehicles, which is covered by scooters, uh, electric scooters, electric four wheelers and three wheelers and uh, electric buses. The key aspects of the project included assessing the market potential across these three markets and then identifying the high potential business models along with the key constraints that basically restrict its large scale adoption and based on the barriers assessed, develop an action plan roadmap, which helps in creating the right enabling environment to, to include private sector uh, investment in the sector and accelerate transition to EVs. So amongst these, I'll just briefly touch upon a few of the key barriers that came across from over 100 stakeholder consultations that we did during the study. Uh, so to start with it, the, the goods and services tax, which is, uh, impl uh, which is basically on all the commodities that we use, is a differential when you purchase an EV with the battery versus when you purchase it separately. So the differential is 5% for fixed and 18% for batteries which are sold separately or are subscribed, which creates a big distortion in the market and makes it fa less favorable towards those business models. Similarly, there are certain uh, vehicles which are not allowed for commercial use in spite of their high potential for being adopted at a large scale, which includes two wheelers because currently they're categorized as a non-transport vehicle. The three wheelers, which are your L5 category auto, uh, auto rickshaws and not your electric rickshaws, since they are unsafe, they were not included as a part of the study. The L5 auto rickshaws have problems such as registration and permits, since there is a cap on the total number of L5 autos that can ply on the city roads, which again leads to a, a sort of a demand constraint in the market, wherein they, whereas there is a high potential in the sector to sort of uh, uh, coming from the total cost of ownership. On total cost of ownership basis, two wheelers and three wheelers are really, really competitive. So creating these constraints around these markets really hamper its growth. And as many mentioned earlier, 
since this is a new emerging sector and this is a new technology, there is obviously a lot of apprehensions ag around the technology itself and having a lack of secondary market in currently really results in high financing costs, which creates a further distortion in prices when compared to their equivalent ICE variants. So we would be touching upon some of the solutions that we have developed across these barriers. And for electric buses, we'll be going slightly more in detail as we come to the electric bus section. Based on the roadmap that we created, uh, if we implement those proposed recommendations, it we, uh, we can it can result in about 44 million tons of carbon savings. Just to put things in perspective, transport contributes to 13% of the total CO2 emissions. And with all, uh, and with implementing those high impact recommendations that have that have been proposed in this study, we can uh, it can result in 7% reduction in the total land trans uh, in the total CO2 emissions from the land transport sector by 2030. So really, this is the sector that, if focused rightly and in the direction that it should be, uh, can actually have a significant impact on the ground. As we know, in, uh, not just in terms of uh, the carbon savings, this also creates a lot of other benefits in terms of reducing India's uh, fuel bill, creating employment of over 20 uh, of over 26 million jobs in fleet businesses and 700,000 in charging and swapping businesses, and also results in a significant investment, just which is primarily just based on the value of the EVs itself, to about 2,100 mil uh, billion in. 2030. So really, this is the sector if we do, uh, if focused on can have that impact on the ground that we we have been looking for and India is committed to bring. So going by um, now diving slightly further into the key market segments, the first market segment, as we were talking about, were the private uh, private vehicles, which is two wheelers, three wheelers and four wheelers. E-mobility is being looked at as a game changer for the automotive market in India. However, the current penetration of EVs is less than 1%. To, and India's e, uh, electric mobility adoption is going to follow a different trajectory from the rest of the world. We, in fact, have 75% of the registrations in India on a near on-year basis are from two-wheelers. So similarly, the, the EVs growth potential also really lies in the light vehicles. This is furthered by very, very key factors and characteristics of the Indian mobility market, such as large demand for um, two wheelers and three wheelers, which have currently emerged with growth of e-commerce and hyper local deliveries. In fact, the net zero carbon emission targets of uh, e-commerce giants like Amazon, Flipkart, Zomatos, etc., really push the agenda forward and showcase significant potential in bringing these business models to the fore. The triplets in India are less than 10 kilometers, which really helps in furthering electric mobility because the total utilization in a day for, for, from the perspective of fleet businesses as well as for personal mobility are really favored towards adoption of electric mobility uh, of electric vehicles. And as we know that the growth of last mile and shared uh, last mile deliveries and shared mobility has increased, these the, the electric mobility sector is here to stay and grow further. With the interventions that we suggested, India can meet its 30% sales penetration target in those core light vehicle markets such as two wheelers. Uh, but in that, we have created certain further segments of personal and fleet. Fleet basically refers to those which are used for commercial purposes, such as for last mile deliveries or for ride hailing purposes, very similar to what your Uber Moto or an o uh, Ola Auto is. And similarly, for three wheeler and uh, three wheeler freight also refers to the last mile delivery or for the in uh, intercity cargo uh, functions. Um, electric buses at the moment have slightly a disadvantage on the perp uh, when looked at from pure TCO perspective because of its high upfront cost, high cost of financing, and lower utilization, which does not really result in the kind of TCO savings that can push it forward. Having said that, when we look at it from a long-term perspective, e-buses really hold the future. And given that if 
if deployed with the right business models and the com combined with right financial solutions, the, the transition towards electric buses can really be done. And we will be talking about that shortly. So, but uh, to bring home the point, 30%, greater than 30% penetration is really possible in two of the very, very key segments like two wheelers and three wheelers. Um, this is just a summary of the business model. We have had, uh, we had screened over 50 business models on a decision tree framework with three broad, three major criteria, and we had some further criteria related to risk assessment, uh, secondary market, etc. But the three key prim primary parameters were policy support, which was looked at from the perspective of national, state, uh, and actual actual implementation of policies at a local level, market size. Uh, which is coming from market assessment results, which was just presented in the previous slide and TCO parity or savings. Uh, the key business models as so really you, uh, the savings, if you really look at for, for EVs really come in terms of its operational cycles. The more an EV is run, the more savings it will generate. Naturally, so this results in more or, uh, that being favored more for your commercial fleet segments. And that's where uh, the ride hailing and freight fleet, which is your last mile delivery fleet, uh, is a particularly important business model for two wheelers and three wheelers. For four wheelers, the upfront cost is still high. And for at least for personal mobility, uh, it really does not meet the TCOs. Uh, it does not result in TCO parity at the moment in the next five years. However, with improvement in technology reduction, battery prices, it may come. Uh, but at the moment, if you look at the core demand that will come and which will really bring forward the agenda, it would come from the fleet segments, which include the ride hailing fleet and the employee shuttle service. This is also a major agenda, which is coming uh, from a lot of corporates for contributing to zero uh, net carbon emissions from their employee transportation. Uh, what you look towards your right, <clears throat> excuse me, is a priority framework that we have designed for implementing the action plan recommendations. As you can see, the priority priority one are the ones which have less complexity and high impact, and those are the ones which we are really looking forward to get implemented and deliver those kind of results. Key ones include having consistent GST across the EV uh, value chain from the uh, GST on the batteries to the subscription models to the uh, uh, to the vehicles itself. Reducing financing costs, we'll be talking about that in a bit. Uh, categorizing two wheelers and transport vehicles. This will not, uh, not only let them get in part of the commercial fleet, but also improve their safety norms and would really regulate this market. Uh, increasing cap on three wheeler registration and allowing open permit. This has already been uh, uh, sort of being promoted by MOTH to be done by cities. Um, allowing battery swapping in frame and state EV policies. Battery swapping is a facility wherein you can go to a battery swapping station, get your discharge, give away your discharged battery, and take a fully charged one at a price. And the total process involves less than five minutes. So the entire downtime, which is related to charging during a day, uh, th this, this battery swapping solution can really take care of it. Moving forward to electric buses. So electric buses currently are being majorly adopted under the GCC framework, which is being uh, under the FAME subsidy, wherein um, the under the FAME subsidy, there is a, uh, you get an upfront subsidy on the capex of the uh, bus. However, this fame subsidy excludes um, the private part, uh, private fleet operators, which really restricts the total demand and restricts the sizing of this market. Also, again, the e, uh, inconsistent GST rate is also a significant thing which, in, which hampers in deployment of different business models in this market, for example. Um, in the current GCC framework, there are slight irregularities or imbalance, as you can say, in terms of matching responsibility with the knowledge, say the OEM is supposed to do fleet provision as well as fleet operation. Um, the risk allocation is slightly skewed towards the OEM cons consortium, which often results in high bid codes and making EVs or adoption of electric buses significant cost significantly costlier than their ICE equivalents. To counter some of these constraints, we have again proposed an action plan framework for the electric bus market, which Sorry, includes. Madhya. Sorry to disturb. Uh, just uh, can you wrap up in two minutes, please? You're running sure. a short on time. 
Sure, sure, sure. All right. Yes. So, uh, ad having adopted the um, um, the primary recommendations, it can result in approximately 20 to 20. And we have also uh, quickly summing up. We have also presented some unbundling models for bus provision, which includes unbundling of charging infrastructure and aggregation of fleet provision, which can result in about 20 to 25 percent of TCO savings, making it very competitive with the IC equivalents. Uh, going towards the charging infrastructure, this is the backbone of the EV industry and needs to be provided at all levels. However, since EV adoption in, in India is basically from light vehicles, 85% of it would be met from residential charging. All the other charging solutions, including captive charging for fleet provision, public charging stations, swapping stations or depot charging are equally important for deploying the different business models and these modes um, across the value chain. Um, key factors that are influencing the charging infrastructure is the viability of these models currently are not adequate simply because the adoption rates are not too high. So the charging utilization is not high enough to meet or meet the commercial expenses of deploying these chargers. To do that, to ease the burden on the financial player or on the private sector player, separate provision of subsidized tariffs, um, government provision of land at subsidized rate, and allowing different EV technology uh, and allowing different charging technologies, including swapping, are key solutions that are proposed to really bring forward the entire holistic uh, enabling environment for EV deployment. Um, quickly summarizing, we'd also looked at as we have we had been talking about the different financing problems associated with EVs. Um, EVs are just like any other sector, which is really in its infancy because of which the lenders are very apprehensive in lending to this market. This coupled with high counterparty risk, lack of utilization, unsurety about the maintenance cycles and the lack of secondary market really adds that risk premium to the financing that is offered currently in the EV market. We had looked at a bunch of solutions, including user discounts, vehicle subsidy schemes, first loss, first loss guarantee, which basically covers a portion of the loss if the borrower defaults, and a wholesale market de-risking solution, which covers that at an NBFC level, at a wholesale funding level, basically, uh, to be seen as which ones have the highest budgetary efficiency, uh, which basically looks at which ones impact the adoption of EVs the most. The wholesale market de-risking instrument, which is basically providing that first loss facility to NBFCs, has the highest impact on penetration and was tested very, very effective across the different market segments of primary markets, e-buses and charging solutions. Apart from this, investment in this market by in terms of direct equity and debt investments on the manufacturing side or, or the charging side is equally important to really take this um, uh, to really have the market adopt high levels of EV uh, to see high level of EV adoption. Um, this is a short summary of the project findings. And in case you have any other further questions, I'll be happy to address and you can reach out to us. Thank you, Mani. Stop sharing. Many thanks, Mansha, for such an insightful presentation on EV market business models and action plan. Upstream in interventions will definitely develop the EV market and increase sales presentation in India. The right business models will help to accelerate the deployment of e-buses, E2 and E3. I now take this privilege to introduce Dinesh Babu. Dinesh Babu works for Ernest & Young and is currently serves as the team leader for the World Bank funded SPI operated the Grid Connected Rooftop Program Superbar. He has led legacy initiatives uh, including uh, enabling ecosystem for accelerated deployment of rooftop solar in India, solarization of MSME, including One Sun, One, Sun, One World and One Grid and several uh, work on monitoring center. Over to Dinesh Babu. Thank you so much, uh, Sunil, for your generous introduction. It's my pleasure uh, to join the 19th edition of the World Wind Energy Conference 2021 and moderate this session on batteries for storage and electric vehicles. Uh, what a wonderful uh, kind of a scene that was set before uh, by, by Mani, the overall view, the macro view, and then the very specific presentation uh, by, by uh, the experts from Deloitte and, and Steer. And, and that now naturally progresses towards uh, the kind of engagement with different experts and the panelists which we have uh, tried to convene today. 
uh, so that we can have a wonderful convergence of what was presented and what are the views of uh, the, the experts. But formally, let me let me uh, thank uh, the bank and the Terry for this opportunity to moderate this event. Um, I'm always delighted to be part of this uh, exciting topic. And uh, definitely thanks to all the audience. A uh, very good evening to all of you uh, who have decided to spend your Wednesday evening uh, with us on this most exciting topic. Uh, just as a prerogative of a moderator, I thought I'll spend a couple of minutes uh, on the background in terms of how the uh, grid modeling uh, is being done in the country right now with the, the backdrop of what Mani said, uh, country moving forward to uh, becoming net zero uh, and, the, and the intermediate targets towards achieving it. Uh, the NREL USA released in July uh, 2030, uh, India would see close to 160 gigawatt to 800 gigawatt of energy storage capacity. That was a variation they reported corresponding to 50 to 120 gigawatt in power terms. Uh, how, what numbers we will ultimately reach will depend on a couple of things. One is if you are able to put enabling regulations. I believe Deloitte uh, touched it very rightly at the end of the presentation that would unlock the storage value streams. Uh, and of course, the major assumption that no new coal uh, or gas plants are built to avoid adverse impacts of climate change. And of course, the declining cost of energy storage and solar PV. So all these uh, factors would essentially contribute to the estimations and projections as we speak. Uh, but as, as it was uh, assumed by NREL, uh, the contribution uh, from solar, wind, and batteries was more than 65% of the installed capacity in India by 2030. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, BNEF uh, recognized that COVID impact on the materials or the batteries are mostly resolved and supply recovery is underway. Uh, so if lithium and cobalt prices were returned to the peaks of 2018, uh, BNEF's 2030 battery cost reduction uh, would increase to $70 kilo, uh, dollars per kilowatt hour from 58. That's a kind of an estimation BNEF uh, made. Uh, but the sustained high metal cost would delay the average pack prices reaching the crucial $100 per kilowatt hour benchmark by two years. So that's a kind of a estimation from the market, which I thought I could share, share with you. But having said that, the topic of today in terms of the grid scale uh, stationary storage projects and the uh, e-mobility as very well presented by uh, Steer, uh, this, is, this is a very good uh, area in terms of how India could grow and progress uh, to reach a carbon-free grid in five decades from now. Uh, so I, I won't dwell into the details of how the grid scale storage and charging solutions for the e-mobility would evolve. That has been very nicely uh, presented by the previous speakers. Uh, but this will be facilitated, I believe, by the expected fall in the cost of energy storage, which we discussed a few minutes ago. Uh, and in terms of the, uh, the overall estimation in terms of the $100 uh, mark as well. Uh, but what we see is, is also the, the kind of government's effort uh, which, which we will hear uh, very shortly from the experts in the panel, uh, that energy storage as a sector holds a huge promise in establishing an ecosystem, but not just from the technology perspective, but also on the development, deployment, transfer, skill development, business models, financing, uh, quality assurance, technology integration, et cetera. So I think it's, it's a gamut of all the key aspects uh, that the donors like World Bank and ADB have seen across and facilitated for creating the enabling ecosystem, but also the governments, the central and the state governments working in sync to make this happen. That is also equally important. So we have uh, perspectives to be uh, to be shared by uh, Niti IO as well in the panel. Uh, but I can say for sure that exciting times are ahead and we could already witness serious players gearing up uh, and rising to the occasion and playing a significant role uh, in shaping this market. So, but having said that, I would like to now inform uh, you that we have an excellent lineup uh, of, uh, of panelists who have significant experience in not just facilitating uh, the implementation of storage, but also walking the talk. Uh, and we have panelists from the policy and the market making as well, as I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, but due to uh, certain personal uh, uh, issues, Ms. Rashi Gupta would like to go first if other panelists uh, could, could uh, please excuse uh, her because she's in a, in a network, network sensitive zone. Uh, so may I now uh, uh, kind of request Rashi uh, Gupta, fondly known as uh, Battery Value of India, uh, who's the pioneer of uh, manufacturing uh, the advanced lithium batteries. Uh, let me first congratulate you uh, for inaugurating the one megawatt hybrid uh, energy storage project in Gurgaon in Brahma Kumaris. Uh, but let me ask you, uh, how do you, how could you kind of share more light uh, on the best practices deployed, the functions and the experience in implementing uh, the one megawatt system? And also, uh, what is your take on uh, India trying different types of batteries given the materials constraint and recycling challenges? Well, uh, over to you, Rashid. 
thank thank you so much for accommodating me and giving me first uh, and thank you all the uh, organizers for having me here uh, when you talk of the best practices then it's very important to understand what technology you are using and how you are going to implement this entire uh, scenario so what happens is uh, in a uh, in a better work scale system there are a lot of things which you need to be uh, careful of you need to understand uh, Uh, you know, many technicalities come into play, and the safety is of paramount importance in such a big system. You know, and in India, when you uh, when you are not having many trained professionals and persons for uh, hybrid, it just becomes a big challenge. So what we try to do here is uh, evaluate a new hybrid system for this particular client because they were very sensitive to the corner around. and that's what we did and uh, when you talk of evaluating multiple technologies i sincerely think that you know india the way to go ahead is going hybrid having multiple technologies together in one particular system makes the best uh, deal out of the entire uh, scenario you know that is where you get the best of the two worlds also like in this particular case we have used a lead lithium hybrid option wherein uh, we have used uh, A little component of lead batteries to reduce the capital investment by 38 percent. So with this, you know what happened is the capital investment comes down. You get best of the two worlds, and uh, this gives you a long duration storage, which is very much not possible with uh, lithium batteries. So that gives you a big advantage out here. And um, important is having the fire safety, having uh, you know non-hazardous uh, chemistries in the picture, and uh, Having very much trained personnel, you know, this is something which are the best practices one should follow. And these were the challenges that even we faced during the entire journey of this uh, installation. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Rashi. Uh, so that was uh, Rashi Gupta, the managing director of Foundation uh, Mechatronics. Uh, so thanks, thanks for your quick comments. And if you have uh, still a good connection, I would request you to stay on. And share more views about uh, yeah, your experience. Yeah, I'll be around, but I really hope I can stay for the future. Thank you, thank you. Uh, now let uh, let let's move on to um, Mr. Y B K Reddy, who's the AGM uh, at Seki. Uh, he has a he has a good combination of uh, twelve years of experience at Seki, uh, previously at NUS Singapore, and most of the other market experience as well. Uh, so it'll be really great to uh, have a view, uh, kind of a. <clears throat> The entire view uh, of of both the market, both the sides, uh, from from Mr. Reddy. Uh, so, Reddy, could you please share your views uh, on your on your preference of the technologies and how Seki is geared up to create the market uh, for an accelerated deployment of storage solutions? And and of course, uh, in terms of the preference of Seki beyond the round the clock power, what will be the other combinations uh, in terms of the uh, tenders that you will be designing for energy storage? So it'll be really great to know from you uh, the the kind of overall views uh, from from Seki perspective and also from your personal perspective. Over to you, Mr. Reddy. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, organizers, for inviting me for this uh, workshop. Okay. Uh, as you know, sir. Uh, we have been working on uh, various uh, aspects of energy storage uh, right from the uh, smoothing of renewable energy to firming up uh, renewable energy so what we realized it uh, long back in from 2013 onwards we have been continuously working on this because we uh, we have uh, initiated some uh, own projects by seki where uh, uh, we are doing some uh, uh, pilot projects in uh, remote areas like lakshadweep and uh, uh, le ladakh okay and also we are doing uh, projects in uh, chatisgarh uh, with energy storage for uh, majorly for the arbitrage applications uh, that is the thing initially we planned for uh, smoothing of renewable applications but uh, because of some reasons we couldn't uh, uh, finalize those things after that uh, we realized that uh, energy arbitrage will be uh, required because uh, we do have a, a tall targets uh, uh, to achieve in renewable energy sector by 2030 uh, right now it is 500 gigawatt out of which at least 300 gigawatt will be the solar so even all the solar peaks in the known so the uh, load load also may touch around 300 gigawatt it will be very difficult to manage the grid by 2030 we re we realized this fact very early and we started uh, Uh, uh means uh, promoting renew uh, battery energy storage in the renewable energy sector uh, in various fronts actually we uh, uh, 
designed some schemes and uh, uh, projects in such a way that uh, battery storage should be uh, part of it, like RTC tender or the peak power tender, and all, where the pump storage and the battery storage are becoming integral parts. And we realized that some uh, projects, standalone projects also required for that. We have uh, conducted some studies. Uh, in the meantime, Ministry of uh, Power uh, has decided to go uh, for four gigawatt pilot scale projects and uh, standalone battery energy storage in the uh, grid network. So currently we have been working on this uh, uh, guidelines, uh, release of tender for this uh, uh, standalone battery storage projects in the grid, mainly for the uh, grid level applications and also for the arbitrage applications. So various uh, discussions in the in the earlier presentations also people were saying that they require uh, some uh, uh, incentives from the uh, or change in regulations for the like uh, ISTS waiver like that. We have we have been addressing all these things in the pilot projects right now. So soon the notifications will be. Uh, it should and in fact ISTS notification is issued uh, uh, today only I think uh, it is if it is more than 51 percent uh, uh, renewable energy is there so ISTS uh, charging discharging is waived off okay from the battery energy storage project and we are also we are planning to change some uh, small regulations also to fit the battery energy storage into the uh, electricity act actually electricity act requires some modifications to that that also we are working and we are hoping that uh, the, we have already released the model guidelines and tenders and we had taken a couple of consultation meetings at higher level uh, 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 last uh, means yesterday only honorable minister was taken uh, the review from the various uh, developers uh, yes uh, offered uh, means uh, <coughs> given some commitments also from the government side so we are working on it and maybe in 15 days we will be coming out with the final tender for the standalone storage systems and also we'll continue to work on the other innovative bids like that uh, peak power and around the clock renewables and also we are working on a uh, separate bid right now we are planning for a pilot project as a, with Siki investment where uh, uh, the, the renewable energy supply will be firmed up and also provides uh, some flexibility to the off taker uh, uh, not to full flexibility some amount of flexibility will be given to the off taker so that uh, we can step towards uh, uh, means making renewables dispatchable okay so that is uh, uh, means various uh, initiatives we are taken uh, in sake so far uh, we are continue to support the energy storage sir, because without energy storage it is very difficult to uh, means uh, achieve the targets of renewable energy by 2030 or beyond. So we realized that we are, we are, we are uh, committed to uh, means to promote renewable energy, uh, sorry, energy storage in the RSA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so really very interesting points that you have made. I hope the, the, uh, the audience who are on the development side would take a serious note of that. Uh, very quickly, one follow up question is on the technology. So uh, how, how uh, in depth the Seki has done uh, any research in terms of the choice of technologies or it could be technology agnostic or promote initially a specific technology due to the ease of availability and cost control is there any views on that uh, sir in many of the most of the sicky bits we never uh, go with the technology specific bit uh, let us see in the peak power tender we kept it open one project came out with the psp one project which with the battery energy storage is coming even in the battery energy storage we are not specifying the technology actually and we are giving the certain dispatchability of the energy so any technology player can be means uh, uh, means can come and offer the solution even in the standalone solution also we received request to allow 70 percent efficient technologies also we said that no problem we'll allow that so that but we have to keep uh, everyone on the same page so that what we are saying is that we are specifying some efficiency some efficiency if there is any shortfall with a small with a small minor compensation, uh, the lower efficient technologies also can participate. But at the end of the day, uh, for the Seki or for the utilities, uh, uh, it is the economics matters actually uh, more than the technology. But we are keeping uh, uh, all the everything in technology agnostic. But if commercially, if they are okay, uh, we are we are, uh, we are welcoming any technology in the even uh, gravity storage also. We are uh, welcoming that. 
Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Very nice to hear that uh, views from you, Mr. Reddy. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, now let me uh, move to Mr. Randeep Singh, who's the director of electric mobility uh, from Niti Aayog, and he's a senior team member of uh, the ACC program uh, as well under the DHI. Um, he, he's currently working to transform the transport mobility uh, in India. Has a tons and tons of experience in the automobile uh, sector. Now focusing uh, largely and exclusively on batteries, EV policies, standards, financing, etc. And uh, uh, especially very interesting to see that he's working on the initiatives to remove the hurdles of high finance cost uh, for the EV uh, manufacturing. So, um, Mr. Randir, uh, given your background and experience, could you shed more light on the uh, expected outcomes of the ACC RFP, which was uh, recently uh, published and followed by the uh, pre-bid meeting as well? And how do, how will be your views in terms of uh, the financing landscape, which will have to be shaped up uh, the India's uh, storage market? And also combined with that, if you could shed some uh, light on the operational and financial risks uh, you foresee in the battery storage projects. Over to you, Mr. Randhi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dinesh Babu, and thank you for having me here. Uh, so today I would be mainly focusing on power storage, starting with the programs by Government of India to move to green mobility, as well as answering your questions, touching upon the financing part, as well as the risks associated with this. So, of course, this battery storage program, which has been launched, it's for both mobility as well as for stationary storage. So, apart several fiscal and non-fiscal incentives at central and state level, three big schemes are launched by the government of India recently. In fact, in June and July was the landmark month wherein these schemes were either reframed or the gadget notified. First one is the remodeled FAME 2. It is 1.5 billion US dollar. Second is the auto PLI, 3.5 billion US dollars. And the third is the advanced chemistry PLI, which is 2.5 billion US dollars. All the three together, they cover the entire value chain. Where FAME 2 covers the demand side, auto and ACC PLI, it covers the supply side for the EV value chain, as well as the battery storage side. Now, in terms of the advanced chemistry sales program, pre vid meeting was held already been concluded. It was on 12th of November 21. It, we received very, very good response and more than 30 plus serious players participated in the meeting. Uh, uh, it was uh, done in the hybrid mode. So all of these players, we are, they are in touch with us for almost two and a half years. But now when they were present, the questions they were asking, the type of capacity they are going to do, uh, we are ready, we are pretty sure that this is going to be oversubscribed more than 50 uh, because 50 gigawatt hour is the overall capacity now talking about the advanced chemistry cell program it caters to types of storage requirement ev industrial stationary storage requirements in terms of the capacity a person or a bidder or a consortium they can form a consortium and the majority bidder only that player who is having more than 26% of the stake in a consortium, that would be considered the majority player. And it, he can be nominated, only his books of accounts will be looked at. They can quote maximum of 20 gigawatt hour with a minimum of five gigawatt hour. The incremental plus one gigawatt hour can be quoted. The overall capacity which is for the disposal is 50 gigawatt hour. The mechanism which we are following for evaluating this bid is the QCBS mechanism. And it is technology agnostic. So we have uh, provided a matrix. The matrix combines two things. One is the cycle life. And the second is the energy density. So whomsoever falls or whomsoever's technology or the chemistry cell chemistry falls within this matrix, they can quote accordingly. We also have the provision that may, because this program runs for the five years after the appointment date, the subsidy dispersal goes for the uh, plus five years. So how, what we have done is we also, since you know this, uh, somebody was talking about the uh, BNF reports that how the technology is going to change, how the price is going to fall. Uh, of course, these BNF reports are not, uh, their premises are not relevant to India. But of course, once these uh, giga factories comes to India, they will be relevant. So the technology in this field is changing very fast. So we have given a provision of bonus to move these technologies that some, some bidder has quoted for a particular combination of the energy density in a cycle life. They are given the bonus if they want to move horizontally or the vertically. Plus we have the localization requirements. 
within the two years of the appointment date, they have to meet the first milestone, which is the 25% localization requirement at the cell level. And after uh, appoint five years of after the appointment date, 60% of the localization. That is what the minimum uh, at the cell level they have to do. We also to provide further benefit and also the platform because you know uh, the main question which bidders have in this particular this is a new technology uh, and there's no supply chain exists as of now so that whether in a given time frame whether in a given time period they would be in a position to start their factories or not because we have given a limited time frame for them to start their factories so we have given a provision of the state grant challenge wherein all the states would be called together and would be facilitated by us so that you know the bidders and the states can have a one-on-one -on -one interaction and there is a tripartite agreement so that all the whatever queries they have whatever the approvals are required those can be fast tracked the important dates to be kept in mind are now the queries by bidders can be received till 30th of november we will reply to all these queries that means government of india by 17th of december and the bid submission due date is the 31st of december 21 now, those who cannot code for the five gigawatt hour and the technology is not at this, um, you know, the commercialization stage, there's another program called the niche ACC program, which we will be launching, which will have the maximum capacity uh, at disposal five gigawatt hour, and you can code the minimum of the 500 megawatt hour and with up to the maximum of one gigawatt hour, that is 500 megawatt hour to one gigawatt hour. And the total disposal is five gigawatt hour. So we'll be coming out for, for with further details for the niche ACC program soon. This is going to be around three thousand two hundred crores worth of uh, total subsidy program running for the five years. In addition to this, the renewable power capacity addition as per the targets, this will further give boost for the battery storage requirements to pick up. Because once we are going to set up all these factories, there should be the market to pick up uh, these batteries or the cells which are going to be manufactured. So the 50 gigawatt hour is a conservative scenario, taking into account all the stationary and the uh, mobility requirements. In terms of the e-mobility requirements of the battery storage, demands from the demand side, federal and state incentives are adding for the demand to catch up. So uh, there are 17 states who have already launched their EV policies and others are in the draft stage. So the focus of, in addition to this, the focus of EV charging infrastructure is another area which further adds for the e vehicle demand to pick up and is very much in focus. So it's like charging infrastructure, vehicle uh, demand to pick up, and then vehicle demand picks up and the battery storage in the mobility sector also picks up. So it's it's a sort of the chain. Now uh, the next part is the minimum standardization, which has to be done for this charging infra to pick up so that it doesn't hamper the innovation but helps in the faster proliferation of the EV charging with better utilization, flexibility to customers in terms of the interoperability or the guidebooks for the CPOs and the power utility. So we are also working in this direction. In fact, recently, uh, a month back, the Nitya has already launched a handbook for the EV charging infrastructure. Currently, we are also working on the, uh, with the uh, developers at Creda and all on uh, releasing the residential EV charging guidelines, as well as the models. So this is also going to come uh, in the public domain. We'll release it soon. I hope these efforts with the private investments and the demand pool will go a long way in terms of the battery storage requirements and shift to the green mobility through green power. Uh, now I'll take the question uh, uh, which you post regarding the financing part. So we are working with, in fact, with the World Bank on both the sides, from the battery storage side, as well as the demand side, total 1 billion US dollar program. And somebody also spoke about that, uh, the uh, uh, risk sharing and the first loss risk sharing instrument. So uh, this is actually a part of this. It is going to come in different tranches, 250 million US dollar in the first tranche for the batteries, 150 million US dollar in the first tranche for the uh, uh, vehicle side pickup and the, I think SBI is uh, already the program manager for this. In addition to this, for the batteries to pick up, we are also working uh, under TA with the ADB, uh, 1 million US dollar uh, under that. Uh, under this uh, TA, uh, we are also going to cover the, you know, once so it's an entire value chain. 
the cells, batteries, vehicles, charging infra, uh, better utilization, and then finally comes the recycling of these batteries. So that is the area where, which we are going to cover. So this entire circularity is going to be covered through this. Uh, that's all from my end. Over to you. And thank you. If you any questions, I'm happy to take. Perfect. Perfect. No, definitely it was very, very, very useful. Uh, starting from the actual, uh, the practical aspects of what is happening in the tender. Very, very useful insights and uh, also the overall planning of Niti Aayog and the partnership with the donors. Excellent layout. Uh, uh, and you steal the question in terms of what I want to ask Mani about the financing. Uh, you answered it well. I thought I will poke her even though she's not a panelist. She's trying to be a silent spectator now. Uh, but a wonderful uh, sharing of views, uh, Randeer. I'll come back to you. Uh, I, I could see a couple of questions uh, in the on the panel uh, on the chat box, but I'll come back to you very soon. Uh, now, last but not the least, uh, Dupin, uh, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, Dupin Barua is a co-founder and uh, MD of uh, Global Sustainable Energy Solutions, GSES, uh, which is a renewable energy engineering design and training consultancy. Uh, again, Dupin, uh, as, as I mentioned, is a co-founder of this GSES. Uh, parent company is in Australia, and he has been doing wonderful work uh, in, in solar, uh, both off-grid and grid-connected uh, for a long time. I know him for several years since uh, the USAID PhD program way back in 2014, and right now we are closely working under the Suprabha uh, TA program for the rooftop solar. And very interestingly, it was my choice. I pushed uh, Mani to agree to bring him on the panel because he's currently involved in developing uh, the discom based business models for battery storage. Very, very interesting study. Uh, and then it is expected to establish a kind of a discom anchored uh, sol solar and battery storage platform uh, for addressing the energy security, uh, resilient grid, and the climate change. So, uh, Dupan, could you please share uh, your experience in working on the energy storage projects, especially the current ones under the TA program? And also uh, share your thoughts on how the OPEX model for the storage could evolve uh, in the current context of the RESCO being very popular for rooftop, uh, how this could evolve for the battery storage as well. Over to you, Dupin. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, we are working at a little micro level uh, on project basis, project level, I would say. So that actually uh, help us to understand many things that we uh, did not know earlier. So now, because of the study and other things and analysis and all, we we have understood a few micro things. Uh, so as far business model is concerned, uh, that uh, we all know that so CapEx, OpEx uh, are very common uh, models and CapEx can be also uh, funded uh, by the owner or the consumer and also uh, jointly by discount. That is one possibility. Uh, second possibility is uh, the uh, OpEx model uh, by Resco or ESCO, uh, because it can be only BSS or it can be also combined with solar and uh, BSS. Then uh, if when uh, the battery is combined with solar, then definitely there are many benefits can be uh, availed uh, together for all uh, stakeholders, for consumers, as well as uh, for the distribution companies and also for transmission level, depending upon uh, how the battery is used and then uh, how it is managed basically so that is one and the uh, third one is not really uh, now uh, in, in some in, in some countries there is a pilot projects like australia and all so these are basically virtual power plant mode so then it is basically a uh, integration of or aggregation of a multiple number of uh, solar as well as uh, battery storage system in under one virtual platform then uh, this virtual platform can be managed uh, or aggregated by uh, some uh, RESCO or ESCO uh, by, by a third party, or it can also be possible, possibly managed by a distribution company. So in that case, uh, there will be an agreement between the owner, so batteries and solar still can be owned by the consumer, and then, but they will allow that battery and solar to be managed by the, uh, the integrator. So that is one possibility. Uh, while we are actually doing the uh, economic analysis, there are a few very important point, critical points, which is actually linked to uh, finance and technical board, because some technical aspects we found is very important and very critical uh, while doing uh, developing a financial calculations or models. 
So one is definitely the sizing for a consumer. If uh, sizing is not accurate, uh, then uh, it will definitely impact on the uh, finance because uh, if uh, better is oversized because capital cost has a large impact on the uh, financial outcomes. So if better is oversized, then uh, better is not utilized properly, uh, maybe half utilized or whatever. So then uh, it, it will have a negative effect. And maybe actually, or maybe you know, maybe you you get the uh, good results in Excel sheet, but uh, may not get uh, good results in actual benefit. If it is undersized, then uh, all the services may not be uh, as uh, as expected. So sizing is one of the important aspect, and again, sizing also the what is the purpose of sizing that must be determined first. It is for just the pick shaving, whether it is for uh, just shifting or maybe for stabilizing PV, uh, spreading the curve, that is one. And then uh, also other services like NC, if the battery is used for NCD services and all, this, that will be different. So uh, then uh, PV stabilizing particularly is a little bit uh, both very critical because uh, peak shaving or loose shifting is not difficult, it is known, you know the uh, time of the peak and then you know the peak and then you can calculate easily. Uh, for uh, for the energy storage required, but PV stabilization is very critical because uh, PV uh, output uh, fluctuates on uh, minute to minute basis on a day, and then again it is as a seasonal variation uh, from month to month. So both has a very different uh, impact on the sizing, and then uh, again time of uh, so PV has uh, some definite times say nine to say three o'clock or. Four o'clock. Uh, some in summer it is more. Uh, maybe eight thirty to five thirty or six thirty even. Uh, so in some places, uh, for, depending on what time you are considering, sun time or local time, and then winter again it will uh, squeeze uh, the time. So these are the things. Then uh, you have to also understand the what is the peak time. So if there is not much difference between uh, gap between this uh, solar stabilization time as well as the uh, peak time. So then uh, you need to you need a bigger battery. So because you need to, you cannot charge the battery immediately after it is uh, because there is no enough time probably to uh, charge and discharge. The, that is that is important one. That is what we learned from the study. So then uh, uh, the other important part is basically uh, considering the life cycle because uh, your financial models are based on a calendar year, and battery life is based on cycle life. So now uh, the, the calendar life for a battery determine how much cycles uh, actually you use on per day basis and uh, what depth. So uh, depth of the battery also decide the depth of the size and this has decide the number of cycles and then uh, time uh, number of cycles decide the calendar life. For example, uh, also technology is another part. So all lithium ion batteries are not same. So there are different type of batteries. I think previous speakers has mentioned, and then some lithium ion batteries can even last for fifteen thousand cycles, but they will be expensive. But some even within uh, the lower lanes uh, batteries, uh, which has a cycle life of say four thousand to six thousand cycles, can also go up to eight thousand cycles if you discharge it less or at a you know, shallow uh, cycle. So those actually have a lot of impact on uh, because. Uh, the financial results are basically highly dependent on uh, the uh, capital cost. So capital cost is one of the most sensitive parameters. And then if uh, battery life cycle cost is not properly decided or uh, no, estimated, so then uh, uh, your replacement cost could be different. And then that can have a misleading uh, result in financial uh, model. So that is uh, what I just wanted to share from our study. And uh, uh, and these are very important. Of course, other financial aspects are very common, and uh, of course, all all, all uh, inputs are important. But I'm saying that this technical aspect of uh, into the uh, finance inclusion of technical aspects into the uh, financial model is uh, a little bit very critical in terms of uh, you know, providing accurate uh, financial uh, results. That is what I wanted to say, Dinas. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much because the, the technical inputs, as you rightly said, will give you the right financial outputs. So, uh, so that's that's uh, very nice. And and as as you 
uh, also try to explain the the technology aspects yes uh, we should have more no knowledge and uh, details about the different technologies that for the parameters are quite uh, uh, clear in terms of doing a, a generic range uh, of of the options so that the financing becomes easy uh, because it's not going to be that easy to standardize a product overnight uh, as, as Randir was also talking about the standardization it's it's going to be uh, kind of a, a couple of years down the lane to actually standardize a product for financing uh, otherwise it has to be case-to-case yeah. -case basis and then uh, the risk assessment, the appraisal techniques have to be a bit different. Uh, one quick question to you, Bipin, and then we will summarize what happened uh, in the last uh, 40 minutes, is about the skill development. Because since you have spent a lot of time on skill development, what is your uh, outlook? Uh, I, I believe Mani would be interested to know that as well. Yes, I think definitely skill development. Uh, see, skill is basically most of those solar projects or uh, they are decentralized. And when it is decentralized, we have more involvement of uh, people uh, in in designing, in uh, executing the project, and also maintaining the project. And uh, solar has bigger impact on uh, I think link to people's involvement because in every aspect of uh, developing a solar project, right from the uh, site assessment to the uh, decommissioning the project, I think everywhere in every steps, uh, human skill is involved. So, and then uh, you know, the quality of uh, those services are very important uh, for uh, the performance and outcome of the total projects. Battery is not different. Uh, only thing is that battery is a little bit uh, coming in a package. So, it also requires maintenance, but design, as I already mentioned about design things and all. So, those are definitely a little bit high skill, but required. But solar actually, even you use a very highly skilled person design a system and then and installed uh, by somebody, but if it is not properly maintained, so then uh, the whole you know investment can go uh, out of the uh, road because uh, then your uh, solar is not performing, so then uh, everything can go wrong. So that is why I think uh, more important that uh, every uh, step, uh, like we said, you have done some uh, studies uh, for the 250 plus systems uh, in 17 states. So that we have a lot of things actually why uh, these systems are not performing. Uh, the uh, involvement of everybody. So uh, not only the skill, but also awareness is important. For example, uh, stepping on the modules are uh, very common uh, thing we have seen that people even not aware that uh, when people step on the module, so then it actually causes micro cracks and you know long term uh, damage. And cleaning of modules another thing. Uh, for example, uh, like uh, some sites recently have seen that sites are very nice, uh, systems are very nice. Uh, it looks very bright, they clean it properly. But when we see the performance, Excel analyzes the outcomes or uh, performance of the system, it actually is very low uh, than the expected, the way they are maintaining the system. The reason that we understood that they have been using uh, the water, which is actually about 800 ppm hard with hardness of 800 ppm. So when they use the hard water, so then it actually creates a coating over the uh, solar modules, and then uh, it will it will uh, obstruct this sunlight to actually reach into the cell. So actually uh, they will not get uh, what they should actually get. Sunlight is available. Uh, solar plant is looks clean and you know everything is fine, but actually. Uh, the glasses already got some of uh, they lost the transmittivity of the glass. So those are uh, small things, but it's very highly impactful in my opinion uh, to getting the money back from the investment and then uh, overall, you know, industry performance. Thank you. This Thank is you. One of the major reason I think hard water everywhere. Excellent. Uh, so we are mo almost moving close to the end of the session, but. Yeah, I, I, th I think it was a wonderful combination or a, uh, the normal word combo of all the policymakers, the actual facilitators and the uh, technical aspect of it and the implementation experience, which uh, uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Rashi as well. Uh, I think it was it was a good combination of how uh, actually what is happening on ground. Mr. Reddy was very nice to uh, uh, share all the as aspects of how the market is being uh, seeded by, by Seki, including Seki's own investment for a pilot project on storage and, and wonderful news in terms of making the technology agnostic, considering pump storage as well. That's that's wonderful to hear from Seki. 
who will be creating the market and known for seeding the market for a long time in India for battery storage. Uh, and then uh, I would I would appreciate Rashi in terms of uh, sharing the actual uh, aspect, though she was brief, uh, but she was very to the point in terms of uh, how uh, the, the kind of hybrid uh, helped in terms of bringing down all the overall costing and the performance uh, to the to the expectations of the client. And I think many more uh, to come from uh, from uh, Mechatronics as well. So uh, I, I wish her all the best for that. And then uh, we had Randeep who gave a very good overview uh, of, of what is happening on the RFP uh, for the ACC for the first time in the country and every, everybody is looking uh, towards it. Uh, ISA also confirmed that almost 30 uh, participants uh, have have shown interest, so definitely it is going to be over subscribed. And and the way he emphasized on the uh, standardization, etc., was was really nice to hear. And then the kind of uh, circularity, because uh, when we discuss all these topics, we always ignore uh, about the recycling aspect because it's maybe ten years down the lane or twenty five years down the lane. But he mentioned about that, so it's very nice to hear that Nitya was going to work on the overall circularity uh, aspects as well. And last but not the least, Dupin trying to give the technicalities of uh, how. Uh, the whole design could go wrong if you don't uh, understand the technicalities of each and every aspects of those parameters and then how the technical inputs would give the desired financial outputs. Uh, so I believe it was a good uh, combination of, uh, of all the experts giving their different views. Uh, I could also see uh, one question on the ISTS, which Mr. Reddy very promptly replied, uh, so that we need not raise it. But I'm not sure whether Anish is still on the uh, session. There was one question for him uh, whether the regulatory based support framework uh, needed the needed uh, under the study but whether it was observed that the regulatory based support framework is required to push the demand for the stationary power i'm not sure whether uh, maybe money uh, can do that yes yeah uh, i'll come in vinesh anish yeah. unfortunately had to leave sure. yes so when the world bank study was done we also studied what interventions are required on the policy and regulatory front and this uh, study will be out very soon and it's going through the last editorial check and it should be out very soon and we'll be happy to share it with you. Great, thank you so much, Mani. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, so Randir was mentioning about the financing. So Mani, uh, it would be great to hear from your uh, uh, side as well. And then maybe that you can take over the session for me also, uh, if you can give up uh, the, the most desirable news in terms of how the financing is going to get unfolded uh, for the battery storage. So over to you, Mani. Thank you. And Dinesh, I had that in mind for my thank you address. So first, so let me just give an uh, the update because I'm sure everyone's heard about it. So uh, World Bank was uh, requested for $1 billion of financing for transformative mobility and battery storage. This is supposed to be done in tranches. So we are look, and I would, be happy to report that I'm actually in Mumbai right now preparing the first tranche. So, uh, to uh, State Bank of India, and this will be a very similar line. And I'm sure all of you have heard about the line of credit that World Bank has with SPI on the solar rooftop project. So it will be similar. Uh, so it very clearly can be lent to anyone who wants to put up a battery storage solutions because I've heard these questions earlier. I'll just say it's not for manufacturing of battery. It is for battery storage solution installation. And when I say there'll be a line of credit, uh, uh, obviously the World Bank loan is at concessional rate. It will have a bit of more concessional financing and there will be a technical assistance program along with it to take care of the ecosystem that we've all heard about today. The training, the standards, the policy and regulatory. So all the things which need to be put in place so that your financing can finally work will be there through a technical assistance. So that project is being prepared right now. And, uh, uh, you know, so it should be available uh, in the market uh, in the next few months. Great, thank you, thank you so and much. And now I can give a thank you address. <laughs> so, so uh, thank you so much. <laughs> formally end the session and uh, hand it over to you for the closing uh, uh, remarks, Mani. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. I know this is not the best time for people in India at least. So thank you so much. And um, it was actually a very good session. I thought we got different perspectives from different stakeholders. And, and uh, I, it's it's finally coming together, it seems. 
So we have the supply side working with the PLI schemes. We have a lot of work happening on the demand side. We have a very strong tender coming out from Seki. I think we are, you know, every the forces are being aligned, and with the the PM Modi announcing 2070 as net zero, so we are all aligned. It seems to move towards it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the audience, and thank you for the lovely questions. And uh, we look forward to updating you with better news next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.